Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear us okay over there? Well, my people here are giving us a thumbs up. So uh, excellent. Uh, very nice to meet you. Welcome to CMS.5 at CERN. I, my name is Claire Lee. I'm a particle physicist on the CMS experiment working for Fermilab. Okay, I'm Sonia Natale, and uh, I'm uh, here to uh, to guide you underground. Uh, I'm also a particle physicist, but uh, to be more correct, an astroparticle physicist. <laughs> okay. Right, yeah, you work on the uh, experiment that's actually in space on the space station, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, I, I'm part of uh, AMS experiment, which is on the International Space Station, currently since uh, 12 years, taking data. And maybe, okay, we can do some connections, but however, uh, now we are at point 0.5. And uh, okay, I'm, uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm the person just to here to express my interest in uh, accelerator physics and uh, why it's worthwhile to have this visit today here. Right, so today uh, we are going to take you on a journey uh, 100 meters underground to not quite visit the actual detector itself because protons are colliding inside it right now. Uh, we are taking data, it's very exciting. You can see on the screen over there, uh, it says proton physics, stable beams. That means that we have protons colliding right now inside our detector. And uh, But you will be able to go underground to the service cabin and see a lot of the things uh, that is, is there. And there's some cool things. Uh, Sonia is going to show you. Uh, you. You'll be able to see the effect of the CMS's magnetic field, even though we're outside the cavern. Yes, in fact, we cannot access the cavern. But OK, there are many things we can uh, visit underground. And uh, OK. Usually I enjoy so much. I really hope that you can enjoy it with me and uh, I will try not to be Sonia, but basically to be uh, your eyes, your hands. Huh? I, I cannot say your nose, but however, there is no <laughs> However, okay, just uh, to let you be there. Right. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask it as we go, especially if there's something that you see that looks interesting and you'd like us to describe, uh, we'd be more than happy to do that. Yes, maybe I would like, before I, I prepare myself to go underground, uh, I would like just to say that, uh, okay, I'm very happy to, uh, today to meet you uh, virtually. Also because usually I am a moderator of the master classes for, for QuarkNet. So to me, it's a really a, a, a huge pleasure to, to welcome you here. So I think that now uh, I go, I prepare myself to start the visits and I leave the floor to Claire. So you start to, to describe CMS as you want and I will interrupt you times to times to ask uh, uh, to describe what I'm doing. Okay. All right, yeah. great. Yeah, we will see you with your helmet on in a while. Bye. <laughs> so she's going to don her helmet and safety shoes. I'm also wearing my safety shoes today because, uh, as you can see, we're in a we're in a work hall here. This, in fact, where I'm standing, this floor comes off, um, and we can use. There's a shaft underneath us, uh, underneath me, and this is where we can lower pieces of detector in and out of the cavern. Uh, especially at the end of the year when we have the technical stops so we can move things in and out we can do do upgrades we can do maintenance on the detector um it's it's very cool we usually the, the lhc usually runs from the springtime until late autumn and then we shut down over the winter period for maintenance so if you would like to come in the future to visit the actual detector which you can see life size behind me this is a nice this is a life size picture behind me let me let me walk close to it so you can see the scale um, of this of this huge amazing detector which weighs 14,000 tons by the way uh, so yeah this is our beautiful CMS wow. detector. <laughs> it's pretty big so this is a life size <laughs> photograph of it and if you want to see this for real try to make a plan uh, to come and visit uh, in the winter period, November, November to January, that's a good time to to do this. So um, let's start with an overview of where we are currently. So if we look at, uh, I'm going to show a slide uh, over here, which shows an overview 
of the Geneva region. So you've got uh, Lake Geneva in the background over there on the left. You've got Mont Blanc and the Alps in the far, far background. And that yellow circle is the LHC ring. Oh, what am I supposed to? Oh, here we go. I've got a mouse. Can you see my mouse moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So this yellow circle is the 27 kilometer, I think, I think that's what, 18 mile long uh, underground tunnel that houses the LHC. Um, so here is the main CERN site where it says CERN Meran and Atlas. Atlas is another general purpose detector at the LHC. In fact, it's the only of the four large experiments, uh, four large detectors that's in Switzerland. Um, the LHC itself crosses the, the French-Swiss border. And so we have going around the ring in this direction, uh, we have Alice and then coming around here, here at, the, uh, at the point that's closest to us, uh, which is um, up near, uh, we're looking at it as if I'm on top of the Jura Mountains. This is called point four. This is where all the protons are accelerated inside the ring. So there's only one point around the ring where the protons are given the kick of energy to get accelerated as they go around uh, and around. And then on the far side, opposite Atlas, right over here in a little French town called Ceci, uh, we have CMS. C in CMS does not stand for Ceci, it stands for compact. So CMS is compact muon solenoid. It's, it's big. But actually, compared to like Atlas, for example, it is actually a pretty compact uh, detector. Um, muon, the M stands for muon. As you probably know, muons are a type of uh, fundamental particle. They're the same family as electrons, only heavier. And because they travel all the way through the detector, you need a really, really strong magnetic field to bend the muons because they're going really fast. And the more you can bend them, the better measurement you can get of their momentum. And then hence, you know, the better physics results you can get, the more precise measurement of the Higgs boson mass, for example. So the S in CMS stands for solenoid. And we in fact have the most powerful solenoid magnet in the world. Uh, it's 3.8 Tesla. It's a superconducting magnet. We use liquid helium to cool it. Uh, the magnet itself sits at just one degree l more than the temperature of outer space. So slightly warmer than the LHC dipoles, but not much. Uh, and 3.8 te Tesla, that's about 100,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and when Sonia gets down there, you'll actually be able to see the effect of the magnetic. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. We can okay. hear yes, you. Got... Yeah. Okay. Just... Uh... I'm going to, to, to enter the, the door. Just a comment, okay, you were comparing with space. In fact, LHC is uh, cooler than the average uh, temperature in space, which is uh, three Kelvin. So this is a record uh, and also for the magnet of uh, CMS. Now I, I was stopping here because here we have the shaft. I cannot show you very well uh, the shaft, but maybe the ceiling is quite interesting, you know? Not because it's a ceiling, of course, but just because uh, I will show you this uh, uh, picture, this image, uh, when I will be underground. And so you will see that I'm really at minus, uh, let's say, minus 90 meters, uh, not minus 100. Now, if you follow me, uh, I show you how I enter the experimental uh, zone. Now, first of all, I have this door to pass through, and this door has three checks. The first one is a weight check. Then uh, we will show you where I'm putting. OK, we can show there is a sort of square with the yellow dots, and they stay there. This is because uh, the system verifies that, OK, is a person. This is a door for persons. It's not for material. Then. Um, so we cannot put material inside because it's uh, much heavier than uh, than people. And then uh, there is also a check with the infrared beams uh, to check that we are not entering, for example, with the backpacks inside. And the third one, uh, the most important, uh, which recognizes us personally, is uh, the iris check. So the biometrical check. Maybe if you have uh, seen uh, in the past uh, 
Angel and Demons movie, you know that there is uh, something okay. happening uh, because of this door uh, about the iris. But okay, I can only say I don't want to spam and to spoil, uh, but uh, uh, you need to have uh, the blood inside the, eye, uh, the eyes. Otherwise, uh, what you see in the movie, okay, it's quite tricky. Now, coming back to <laughs> the so the, this is uh, the, the, how to say, the, the difference between a science and the science fiction so that I love, I love a lot, but okay, is science fiction. Now to enter, practically, I have my dosimeter. This is my personal dosimeter. We have two kinds of uh, dosimeters. Today I use only this one, which is my personal. This is an integrated dosimeter, which means that, okay, I wear this dosimeter anytime I'm accessing an experimental zone and the, the radiation dose I receive on my body, so on the dosimeter, because I have to wear on my, on my body, is uh, summed up here. And then I have to check these objects to this machine that you see here, uh, any, any, at least once per month. This is a reader, and then the result is sent to the medical center at CERN. Now, of course, if you forget this object in your, in your bag, you fly to US. Uh, you know better than me that uh, there is radiation when you have a high uh, altitude uh, flights. And uh, this happened once. Uh, and uh, the poor chap, when he came back, he was just checking the, the dosimeter. And uh, okay, you can imagine it was going overflow. It was immediately called by the medical service, uh, service at CERN. Uh, and then uh, he explained that. It was not an easy moment for this guy, I should say, because he got a lot of complaints. Um, yes, we should be precise. Now, okay, what I do, I badge this object on this reader, and then I'm recognized. I enter the door, and Noemi, she's with me. Okay, you cannot see her, but then I would like to show her, because I'm not alone. Um, she will show you how I'm entering, okay, inside. I start badging. Entering inside. Biometrical reading. And then I'm done. And now is uh, Noemi. She's, uh, uh, she uh, needs sometimes because she has uh, also the camera. So she needs uh, to badge and to, to hide, if you want, the camera from the infrared beams. Otherwise, she, she cannot, the system doesn't accept us. She should show you in this moment uh, the iris check through the camera. Yes, done. And now we are in the door. If you would have been here, if you would have been here, this is uh, our box for helmets. And we have uh, two kinds of helmets, the, the, the orange for visitors and the blue for VIP. Uh, now, let's go here. Here there is another entrance with other yellow doors for people, uh, work, for workers, of course. And for visitors, as you can imagine, you don't have your, uh, you don't have your iris uh, biometrical information inside the CERN database. So you couldn't use these uh, yellow doors unless you do as angel and demons. <laughs> but... Yeah. We, we bypass the system because we have this blue door. This blue door is for material. So basically, when uh, uh, somebody has to introduce material here, uh, leaves the material inside of this door because there are two doors in between, and then the badges in a, he badges inside the, through the, the, the green doors, and then can recover the material here. Now, on the other side, in front of this blue door, we have the elevator. Now the elevator is going down because there were there was a group of people going down. Uh, I wait for a moment. Uh, I can uh, gain some time just uh, describing you. We have uh, three levels here. Is the minus one, which corresponds more or less to minus 80 meters. Then we have the minus two, which is minus 90, and the minus three, which is minus 100. Okay, minus 97. I was cheating a little bit, <laughs> but <laughs> however, yeah, okay, just roughly, let's say. But uh, we will uh, access the minus 
two, uh, this is because basically the minus two, when we can enter the experimental cavern, uh, brings you to the middle level of the experiment. And then Clara, she will uh, show you the pictures of the detector. And so you will see that the detector, of course, has the, is on the basement. And then there is the roof, let's say the top. And then you have this middle level. And in this middle level, we have a balcony. And this uh, is the best place to have a nice view of the experiment. This is why we go there. But as we cannot enter, we will stick on the path we usually do, and we we will see what we can uh, we can uh, we have there, uh, and we will play a little bit with something. Um, you are all teachers, but uh, today you will enjoy something. Okay, I don't know. I, I, I it's a surprise. Let's see if you like it or not. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a surprise. It's a surprise. Don't worry. I don't want really to spoil uh, to spoil too much. Uh, okay. Um, just wait in the elevator. We are. It's coming up. Minus ten meters. Eight, seven. Uh, it's a big elevator. Uh, on the on the floor, we still uh, have. Uh, the sign for only five people inside. This is uh, uh, something from the COVID time. So we were allowed to ah. be in five. Yes, so we have the, 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 the position. And then you see, okay, the buttons I was saying. Now I go to minus two. And I think that as I, we go down, the connection will stop and I leave the floor to uh, clear. Thanks, Sonia. So while Sonia is busy going underground, uh, I have a picture uh, over here. This is a schematic drawing of the area and you can see the four shafts underground that go down to the four experiments. So they're uh, going down 80, 80, 86 meters uh, underground is, uh, is where Sonia is going to get off um, for the CMS experiment. Now, one interesting thing that you may not know about the LHC is when they built the tunnel, they had to squeeze this uh, 27 kilometer long uh, circumference tunnel in between Lake Geneva, which is down there in front of me, and the range of mountains known as the Jura, which is behind me. And one of the ways that the, one of the only ways they could do that is to was to tilt the tunnel. So the whole Large Hadron Collider tunnel is not sitting flat, but it's actually tilted at an angle of a few degrees. Now, because our detector has to be perfectly aligned to the machine, this means that our 14,000 ton detector is also slightly tilted downwards at an angle of a few degrees. So just from an engineering point of view, imagine building something that has to sit for 30 years, tilted at a few, uh, at a few degrees, and still maintain you know, microscopic precision so that we can get good measurements for the particles. So while we're doing that, um, what we've also got up, upstairs here is this really, really nice map of the, uh, of the, over, of the you know, surrounding region. So uh, let me show you what actually happens to get protons into the LHC. We don't just stick protons straight away. In fact, we start off with a little tank of hydrogen gas and the tank itself is not much bigger than a water bottle and this uh, you know a, a, a bottle of hydrogen like that could power the LHC for 100,000 years uh, that's how many protons you have in a tank of hydrogen gas so pro, uh, hydrogen is is one proton one electron what we do is we strip the electron off using a using an electric field, and then you're left with with, with just protons. And these these protons go down a linear accelerator into a tiny little booster accelerator, which then gets fed into um, well that was actually the proton synchrotron, and now this is the the super proton synchrotron, which used to be CERN's uh, highest energy particle accelerator back in the day. And then only after they've got a bit more energy there are they fed into, uh, into the LHC going in two different directions at once. So once the LHC is filled up with protons um, in, in nice, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's got protons all the way around in nice little bunches, then they start accelerating them. And once they're at high energy, which is 99.9999991% the speed of light, then they start colliding them at four points around the ring. 
And so at each of those four points, because we want to see what's coming out of those collisions, we have built gigantic particle detectors, which are basically like you know, huge three-dimensional digital cameras um, that are taking snapshots 40 billion times per second every time we have protons colliding inside the LHC. Um, and yeah, so what happens is the protons collide. So the, the LHC team is responsible for getting the protons into the LHC, speeding them up and making them collide. And then the teams for each of the experiments, we, we are responsible for getting what comes out of the collisions. And uh, what we want to do here at CMS is try to catch anything and everything that comes out of proton-proton collisions at the LHC. And the best way to do that is to build a detector that covers as much of the region as possible. Now, if you have a head-on collision, uh, things are gonna fly out in all directions. And the best type of uh, detector would probably be a spherical one. But from an engineering perspective, that's actually really hard to build. I think there was one spherical detector particle like ever built, which was called a crystal ball, because it was literally a crystal ball. But yes, apart yes, from that, ball, yeah. yeah. But apart from that, um, it's 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 easier for us to build things in a cylinder shape. So we have a cylinder shape, and then to catch the bits that go out the end, uh, we have you know a lid and a uh, you know lids on the barrel. Um, and if you look over here, the top, the, the top two detectors, Atlas and CMS, those are the general purpose detectors. Um, so they are really perfectly symmetric, um, both left to right and, you know, top to bottom cylindrically. And these detectors come in different layers. And each layer measures something diff different about the particles as they move through the detector. And when we put all of this information together from all of the different layers, we're able to tell whether it was a proton or an electron or a muon or something else that moved through the detector. How are you doing this? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, I was waiting uh, and listening what you were saying. Very interesting. In fact, the crystal ball and that, but uh, the, the size was smaller. I guess that there were, that there were some uh, detectors, uh, but not particle uh, physics detectors, uh, uh, as a borexin or something uh, cylindrical or or, a, or a spherical. But okay, not the shape of the detectors we have now. So very interesting to hear about this. So now uh, where I am, I don't know if you can see me. Yes, we can I'm see underground. You. Yes, okay, I can show you that I'm not cheating. I'm really underground, <laughs> but I'm just in front of the elevator. I was. Uh, I was inside here, I can call it back. However, this is a very important place. Why? Because this place is a, a safety place underground. Um, it's uh, overpressurized. And uh, this means that uh, if something happens uh, outside this door, there is, there, are, uh, there is a door here and there is another one in the back on the other, on the opposite side. Okay, this... Uh, uh, this uh, zone is uh, protected because it's overpressurized. It means that uh, no smoke or gas leak leakage can enter here. This is also a waiting point in case we have to evacuate because the evacuation is done only through the elevator. Again, why? Because the stairs, we have, of course, stairs, but the stairs, that they are not protected. This means that we cannot go up uh, through them and we, we must use the elevator. Now, um, this, uh, this is, uh, let's say, is one of the different things uh, in the usual life, because usually when you have a, a, a fire in a building, they ask, uh, the fire brigade asks you not to use the elevator, but this is exactly because the elevator in the buildings is not protected, why here it is. So uh, the, the thing is that if there is an evacuation alarm, how it sounds, I don't know, maybe it can happen even now, why not? Okay, we, we can gain a, a special visit today. I don't know. However, <laughs> is it siren? Let's try siren. not to set a fire downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> you know. 
fire, no fire, just the siren, no, no problem. You know, I'm close to the elevator. I can go up immediately with Noemi. <laughs> I was just joking. A siren, it was just to make it out to say more practical, you know, because, uh, okay, I, I can say, but if you can hear, hear the, the, the siren, it's much better. 10 seconds on three seconds down okay at this moment uh, the the lights uh, they start uh, they change they are yellow they blink so you you hear evacuation alarm so wherever you are you have to reach this point and to evacuate through the elevators what happens if there is a power cut and the elevator doesn't work you wait here you are safe in any case as i explained before and you can you have we have the i call it the big brother we have the control room looking at us through the webcams and uh, you can talk with the fire brigade this is a special mobile uh, special phone which uh, you can st immediately use and there is a fireman on the other side he knows exactly the point uh, the, the position of this uh, object and uh, we are all trained to use the extinguisher to start an evacuation <clears throat> alarm if we see something strange uh, we have we can are also trained to be first aider okay we are not doctors but whatever now i yes. enter the experimental door these are fire doors so very heavy but i do and uh, because of the over preservation we have to accompany the door otherwise the slam where we are we are here now so the first thing uh, i would like to show you is the famous ceiling uh, that was not so interesting before, but maybe it's much more interesting now. I know that Noemi can do this, so I ask her, just if you look at the top, you will see a light, a gray light, a gray light uh, square, let's say. Yeah, and we can see. The light. Yes, exactly, because I'm I was uh, before I was there, and now I'm down. Uh, and now if... Uh, you see some lights. This is uh, simply an artistic, uh, uh, let's say, way to say that we take data, as uh, Claire was saying, uh, here underground, uh, we bring them on surface to analyze them. We can show maybe also the minus 100. We cannot access the minus 100, but I can show you at least the level, because I'm the middle level, as I said before which uh, is this one. You can see this, uh, this uh, uh, black floor with these uh, strips, uh, yellow and black strips. And uh, maybe, I don't know if it's visible, uh, Claire, can you confirm me that we see, you see also the wall with the, the, the concrete blocks or not? Yes, can you uh, see that's it? right. We can see the yes. concrete door. Over yes, there, exactly. The because yes, because this usually when we are not taking data, so there is no beam. This is a corridor. Is not a, a, is a, is a, a an entrance to the to the cavern. So there are no concrete blocks. They are removed or rebuilt each time that we stop the beam and we start the beam respectively and the, the corridor has a thickness of about seven meters which is basically the uh, let's say the the wall that separates the what i i call it what is called the service cavern where i am now and the experimental cavern on the other side i ask noemi just to Give me the, because I want to use my hands. You know, I'm coming from Italy and I know that usually you say that Italians so use hands. So I will manage to use my hands. Now, okay, you have uh, two caverns like that. This is one cavern, very long and uh, tight, which is the service cavern where I am. And now we are in the middle and I go back in this direction and uh, we will reach uh, the last point we can go without entering the experimental cavern. On my side here is on my uh, right, I have the other cavern, the parallel cavern, which is a shorter and larger where the detector is. And uh, this corridor connects the two and the other door I will show you connects also the, the two caverns. OK, so uh, now, Claire. And um, you are sorry, Sonia, you are yeah. you are on the level of the LHC beam pipe right now. Yes, right. exactly. Yes, and, exactly. Which is the middle level. Right. And the CMS and, detector, so the collisions happen in the middle and the CMS detector stretches above and below you for about seven and a half meters in each direction. Yes, exactly. And OK, as you are giving the technical numbers and scientific numbers, let me be the part which is more creative and um, 
I'm used to say uh, this is not scientific, but there is a picture that you can keep or maybe you can reuse, reuse with your students so that all the detectors, the cylindrical detectors uh, um, on the on the on an accelerator, on a collider that Claire was uh, talking about before, they are nothing else. You know a kebab with a stick. You take the kebab, you put horizontal, and you just bend in a ring the stick of the kebab. You have you have this uh, this your LHC with the, the the detectors which are cylindrical detectors. This is a, a creative way to 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 make uh, to give a picture of what is the uh, the the what is what you see here for example from this picture that i think claire already told you now claire you're, I was you're making saying, me hungry i want to go and build a yeah, kebab yeah. and have a barbecue tonight with, yes with but if detectives. you want that i can switch to the to the sweets if you want to the because you know if we talk about the 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 weight oh. of cms and atlas you know uh CMS has a weight of uh, 14,000 tons, so it's a huge weight, while Atlas is more or less the half, despite Atlas, uh, Atlas uh, size, uh, it's uh, almost the double of CMS. And uh, my personal, again, uh, a comparison always with food, because I think that if you want to hit the, the fantasy uh, and the memory of uh, young people, or you should always uh, connect with practical things, is that uh, Atlas uh, is uh, a souffle and the CMS is a brownie, you know? This gives the idea <laughs> of you know? <laughs> and I'm sure that maybe they will not recon uh, remember it too much about CMS, but for sure this comparison, students, they can remember. It's uh, it's uh, it's really, they say, effective, I know. I would like to enter now the counting room where there is the brain, a part of the brain of CMS. Uh, of course, you know that we have to use electronics to make interpretation and to filter our data. Then I will leave Claire to give more details about this because it's a very noisy place. Not for you, because you don't hear the, the background the, the, the noise in the background, but for me. So I will go through the corridors uh, showing the cables, showing uh, the, how to say, the precision and uh, how good that this cable has have been uh, connected. But I leave uh, Claire to describe uh, the things there. Uh, re I repeat, cables and optical fibers. Uh, follow me. Okay. Yeah, so on the on the picture, on the diagram on the screen, this is a schematic diagram of CMS uh, showing the different layers. And if you like numbers, you know, you can see that, uh, for example, there are 66 million channels on just the most innermost layer. See, no visitors beyond this point because now you're going into a special area where if you were here in person, you wouldn't be able to go. So what we're looking at over there are all the computing uh, or, or all the racks uh, that power the detector. So we have uh, we have the high voltages because to be able to measure these tiny, tiny little particles, oh, we usually need very high, high uh, voltage electric fields so that we can get a signal. So that's what we have over there. Um, we also have uh, controlling, we have gas. Uh, gases being controlled from inside there that is uh, part of the cooling systems in the detector as well as part of some of the detectors itself a lot of the muon systems use gas uh, in a high voltage electric field to get a signal from a muon and then of course uh, as Sonia was saying just the readout so there's so many channels coming out of the detector and so many collisions per second that we just have this flood of data if you imagine as you if you imagine standing next to a waterfall the waterfall is the data that is coming straight out of the detector just from the the information from the particles that are flying through it every 25 nanoseconds from collisions inside the LHC and we are able to store one cup like one little one glass full of water. That is what we can store. So we have to be very clever in choosing which of the information we actually do store and choosing which of the information we have to ignore and and potentially and throw away. Um, and there's whole teams of people just working on making sure 
that those tiny cupfuls of data that we store are the best cups and the most useful cups and the cups that contain things like Higgs bosons and potential other signatures that you know could be dark matter or or microscopic black holes or something else that would be totally awesome to find. Claire. Yes, I, 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 I see that you follow me in the food path with the water. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of food and water in this heat. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I was just showing uh, uh, optical fibers. And as you were talking about high voltage, I show you one, uh, one uh, wall, which I like a lot. Not because it's red. You will see. This is high voltage. I stay pay attention. So this is high voltage, uh, but I like this wall uh, uh, because uh, I see, uh, you know, in a, in a part of my of my career, I was doing cable cabling of optical fibers, not uh, this kind of cables, but I know that uh, it's not so simple when you have to cable to make the cabling. For example, if you see how cable cables are are bent. Uh, and uh, you could imagine that we have to 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 measure the length of each cable because you have to follow the natural bending of the cable to reach the connector. So you cannot uh, pull uh, or push too much the, the cable. And if you have a look of this uh, wall, you you can imagine how much time it takes uh, to label each cable, to measure each length, uh, to group the cables. Uh, uh, to me, um, now I switch on art. Uh, so I, I wonder, if, I wonder if we have any questions from uh, the audience about what's actually going on over here uh, before we head through to the final part yes, of the uh, underground. Yes, tour. we can. They can ask if they want. However, just let me say in the. I don't know if they can ask directly or can they can write on on the chat. I don't know what is the agreement. I think However, they can just ask directly. Yes. How much time it takes to do this work? You ne really need to be out of what you are doing, uh, which means, for example, switch off or put on silent your mobile phone without any vibration, because you need really to be focused on this work. Now, uh, I don't know. Are there any, any questions from here? Do you want to see again something? Or otherwise, I go down, because we have the last part of our path, which is there. Yes, Noam is uh, closing again at the part. We have to go down, but I don't know. Are, are, are there any questions, Claire? Uh, any pressing questions uh, in the room there? We can see you, so just wave your hand if you want to ask yes, something. Yes, I go, I go down. Oh. All right, let's 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 follow you, Sonia. Yes, What's okay. that red door over there? Yes, this is a red door. You see, we are meeting also other people uh, here visiting... Uh, and they have the yellow helmet because they are visitors and there is a guide. <laughs> so you see, this is uh, so you can see what could happen to you if you come here in person. Now, OK, we have a scaring object here is not scaring is oh, really wow. useful is the safety mask that we have to use if we work inside or that we can use in case of an evacuation. And we have to wear to protect ourselves because there is gas leakage. Consider that all this stuff, OK, not the helmet, of course, but all the stuff. So the, the goggles and the rest, they are inside this box. OK, and so we are, I don't know if this works. I don't think so. The, this, uh, we have uh, we have to open this box and to uh, unfold everything to wear, and this should be done. We are trained to do in uh, more or less thirty seconds. Now, what is interesting here is the famous red door. The red door, as you see, you can imagine that these. Are, if you see the shape, this is bringing us to the LHC tunnel. But this door is not here to reach the LHC tunnel neither for people working in LHC or for CMS people. This one is just a second escape door, you see? So this means that this is here for safety, but this is so important because this is the reason why uh, even during the data taking, we can be here. The other detectors now, they are completely closed. You cannot access underground when you have collisions while CMS is open 
all the year. The only difference in CMS is that you can access the experimental cavern or you can stay here in the service cavern. Now, uh, I know that there is a picture, maybe Claire can uh, re-see with you, but I would like to show you this, uh, this uh, map because now, okay, this is a map, it should be 90 degree rotated because basically here the situation is that this is the service cavern and this one is the, the, the experimental cavern and they are turned 90 degree uh, on, the, on the right, okay? But we here is the elevator I, I I used to come here. This is the shaft room where you saw the the um, the ceiling. Here is the counting room, and the red door is here. So you see immediately that this corridor can make us accessing the LHC tunnel, which is this stick at this level. But there is another interesting thing. It is the second corridor, which brings us to an elevator. And this is the second elevator we can use in case we cannot go back to the main one we have here. And this is why, and as this elevator, as you see, is on the side of the, experiment, the, of the service cavern, is not on the other side of the experimental cavern. This is why we can come here at any time in the year. The other experiments, they have, of course, a second escape path, but the, the second escape path is on the other side. So this means that if you want to reach the second elevator, you have to go through the experimental cavern. And the CERN has decided that even if during the evacuation alarm, there is no beam, of course, uh, they don't want at least visitors to go through the experimental cavern because the residual radioactive background, and so they do not allow visitors to come underground if there is data taking. But this is a very peculiar sp um, think of CMS. All the others, so if you want to come anytime here at CMS, you, you are sure at least that you can access this level, okay? Now, uh, Claire, do you want to add a few things? Because I, I managed to to prepare my surprise and sure, then I absolutely. Do my, perform my show. Okay. Okay, yeah. So um so on the screen, um what what we are looking at here is is a slice, like a pizza slice wedge out of the detector. And I wanted to show you this so you can see the different layers of the detector. So right inside, uh right close to the beam. Oh, yikes, we've got a we've got a thing. All right, great. <laughs> got rid of the thing. So um, what's happening here is on the left-hand side of the diagram, that is the collision point right there on the left. So imagine taking that, that wedge and you know making it go all the way around uh, like that into a circle. We're just looking at one little wedge for now. So that point over there is the collision point, And then you have particles moving outwards from the collision point through our detector. Right close to that collision point, we have the tracking detectors. And these detectors are able to handle a huge amount of radiation, um, but they're designed to measure very precisely the position of charged particles as they move through, the, move, move through them. And we want particles to move through the tracker so that we can get a nice long part. It's like, you know, you know it, it, we get a signal like ding, 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 ding. And then we can do a join the dots. And that shows us the path that uh, a particle, a charged particle has moved through the tracker. Now around the tracker, what we want to do is we Claire, want to, yes. Sorry, Are no, you ready? sorry to interrupt. Yeah, man, no, sorry to interrupt you. As there is also the visit going on here, sure. I would like uh, just uh, to show so I, I uh, can let them free to go to the same point. So okay. I just ask them to wait. If uh, for you is not uh, a problem to stop just in this moment, I can no, proceed. I do. Okay, yes, yeah, thank you very much. So I prepared my very expensive detector for a magnetic field. This is an electromagnetic field detector. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Now I'm asking to my audience, why are you laughing? This is a detector. <laughs> I will show you. I will show you. I will show you. I know that usually we do something else with these clips, but this is a detector. So please. You see, okay, I think I can convince you that this is not magnetized, okay? So 
Now, follow me, please. And I asked Noemi maybe to point in particular on this uh, clip and uh, we will see what happens. Okay, I try to stay as steady as I can. So Sonia is now moving see. closer and closer to yes, the closer and closer CMS to the experimental detector. cavern. Oh, cool. Yes, exactly. Can you see this? Can you see this? Can you see this? Follow, 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 please. Look, look oh, what oh. happens. Oh, wow. oh, just a moment. Let's do something else. Behind yes. that wall over there, where it's where that those make those uh paper clips are pointing, that is where the center of the CMS detector is behind that, behind that, and, and there's More like less, seven yes, meters seven of meters. concrete in between. Yes, exactly. And the, the detector is more or less, so you see, you can see, okay, as I'm, uh, you see, I have uh, many other things here. Also, somebody puts uh, other clips uh, and okay, maybe I can do, I don't know, Claire. Yes. Okay, Claire, I don't know if it takes like that. Ah, oh, see for oh. see for Claire, see for yeah, CMS. see for Claire, and that's for and that's for. Okay, you see Claire, we Yay. see and that's okay. We just need an M. We just need <laughs> someone in the room. Do you do you have a, yes. an, a a name starting with M? No one in the room has a no, name starting. No one. A name no starting. One. Yes. That's amazing. Matthew, somebody. Matthew, so look, yeah, there we go. Now, okay, I, I prove that this is a, is a detector. Look, now, what we do with this? Uh, this is uh, quite common for all guides. Uh, we start, uh, you know, this wall is no magnetic, but the screws, they are. So one of the first things we do is this one, which is nice. You see, you have your pendulum. You can do this. And then once, uh, now I'm just describing you all, all my mistakes I did here. And then I found that they were so great to, to show people. Once I was, uh, I don't know, shaking my hands and these uh, second clips went here. And I saw this, instead saying, ah, okay, this is bad with respect to the previous one. I started to do my magnetic wings. The swing, you see? That is so this cool. is the magnetic swing, wow. you see? Wow. And I can, uh, please uh, believe me, <laughs> If you go in resonance, uh, you feel uh, that the chain is pushing up your hand, your fingers, okay? Now, what happened to me once? Uh, that, okay, I wanted to show this uh, exercise uh, to a group and uh, the chain was uh, falling down. I did what, the first time I thought that this was because of me. I was not paying attention to putting the clips in the right place. And then I did again and it was again down on the floor the third time i understood that there was something which was not because of me and i understood that the weight of the chain was too much with respect to the magnetic field here and so i removed some clips and i was able to show this but then what i did i went after the visit to the to the um, to the control room and i asked to the to the shift leader what was go going on with the magnetic field? It was a guy just working on the on the on his laptop and uh, without, uh, okay, I was kind. I said, first I said, may I ask you a question? And <laughs> with, he was talking, uh, he was uh, just uh, working on the keyboard. He said, yes, but he was even not looking at me. And then I said, <laughs> look, uh, what is going with the magnetic field? And at that point, he, he suddenly stopped. He looked at me and he said, how do you know this? And then I said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's, he's, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm not, it, something which happened. And uh, he laughed and he said to me, you know, this morning we had a, a problem with the magnetic field and now we are running with the half of the intensity. So if uh, I'm asking, uh, and this is an official requirement, if I could calibrate this chain, each clip for a certain amount of magnetic field, I could roughly, of course, measure the magnetic field. Now, if I, I don't have time, I know, because uh, the technical stuff uh, is uh, just telling me that I have to go. But however, if I would have had time, I could uh, have added uh, some other clips here until I can see how many clips can stay, I can keep in this chain without seeing the chain falling up. And this would be the maximum magnetic field, which is at 3.8 Tesla inside. And as Claire said, okay, we are, uh, okay, there is a seven meter uh, concrete wall and we are more or less 
at, I don't know, 20 meters, 25 meters from uh, the detector. It's uh, something like that. Imagine that, okay, I have the detect this picture, but it is uh, in that side. Um, so that sounds like a that... really cool practical experiment to do with a group of students uh, if they, yes, if they exactly. come here. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Look, uh, there is another thing. Uh, okay, I have two, three things that I usually show. This one. Can you see this? This is a compass. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, usually I invite, uh, so you see, and okay, the, the magnetic field lines, they are uh, changing, of course. And uh, what is nice is that uh, this is not a magnet, of course, it's just uh, a clip which magnetizes. So I can uh, move the clips uh, at um, 180 degrees, as you see. But if I try to move uh, 90 degrees, uh, you see, I cannot because it's not aligned with the magnetic field. This is another nice experiment that can, is really talking to students here. And the last thing, which is again, something that happened to me, always I, I was looking for my, for my chain and I didn't find my chain inside this bag. Original IKEA, I'm not doing advertising, but however, and okay, I saw this, uh, I have these clips uh, and uh, these clips, uh, they are all free, but they went on the floor. And uh, when they went on the floor, it happened this. Now I'm just putting few of them, okay? But this was really by chance that I saw this, you see? Wow, that's so cool. Even on the floor, even on, okay, this not, yes, even on the floor, you see? Can you see how they're tilting up there? <laughs> Can you see there? Now, okay, you see they're moving because I was moving, but if I do some wind, let's say, they do not move. Look what happens with this one. Oh, Can nice. you see? Yeah. Can you see this? Nice. Can you see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now if you put more, I show you the last thing which is related. This happened uh, again, always uh, practicing with students, uh, okay? So you have many, many clips and okay, at a certain point you want to collect them again, okay? So you start like that, very nice, very nice. Uh, I did everything, yes. Okay, now, um, can you know, let me just uh, show. Now you see the clip can, uh, can stay together in this position. But that, now if I go a little bit far, not more than 30 centimeters from the wall of the detector, so I go far from the detector, looks what happened. <laughs> Have you seen everything down? I don't know if you yeah, had the drop. Mm -hmm. Yes, down. why the drop? Because here the magnetic field is not enough to keep all these clips together. Here I can, you see. That's uh, an amazing gradient right there. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I don't know if you can show from the top if it's uh, visible. You it's see a good this? thing your boots aren't made of steel, because otherwise you would be stuck. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you see now that they are here. Look again. I'm just move. Okay, this is uh, I don't know uh, oh. seventy centimeters. No more. This one. Look, if I move from this edge, I want to reach the other edge. It drops in the middle because here the magnetic field is weaker. And so I cannot keep all the, the clips together. So you see, we play with clips, but these are detectors. I hope that I convinced you. Okay, Claire, I leave you the floor. I just let me say this and then I leave you the floor. This is the door that in case we can enter the cavern, we can allow people to go through uh, of course, uh, we had to bypass uh, the, the, the system, the biomedical system, but we can do with the key. So we open the doors, the, the visitors enters, and then we have a corridor, not more than uh, more or less uh, seven meters, uh, something like that, as the thickness uh, of this, uh, of the wall, of this wall. And then we enter on the other side, we enter the, the experimental cavern. Now, unfortunately, as you see, we cannot go. You see that there is a, the, is a, 
it's in a scaring uh, red the signal. <laughs> yeah, I think it's rather fortunate that we can't go through there because uh, I don't want to start glowing or anything around here. No, mm -hmm. no, no, it's better not to go. It's better not to go. We will wait for the next access aura from January to, to March. And then, okay, we have to stop here. Now, uh, I leave you the floor to, to Claire. In case you have any question, you want me to stop again in some places we have seen, uh, do not hesitate, please. Don't be shy. Be protons uh, instead of being uh, neutrinos, uh, please. And uh, <laughs> We do yes, have questions. Yes. They do have questions. Thanks. That Thank you so much, Sonia. That was really amazing with those, uh, with all those paper clips. Are we going to? Are you going to pass by the control room as well, so we can get a, a peek in there? Uh, I don't know. If we have time, I can go there. Okay, let's do that. So why don't I answer some questions in the meantime while Sonia is on her way back up the uh, eighty-six point nine meters that she has to go. My question is: Is why doesn't the paper clip uh, magnetize sideways? Why is it always the long direction? Why is, can you repeat the the, 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 the question, Claire? So the uh -huh. question is, why does the ma the paperclip magnet, uh, magnetize in the, the longitudinal direction of the paperclip rather like lengthwise, not, not sideways? And sorry, there was a, there was a, there was a, an interruption. Uh, why the paperclips magnetize and then well, why they magnetize and they align lengthwise uh, through through the the lines of the magnetic field? He's saying this is the question. Yeah, so I think it's to I mean yeah. the way that I understand it, it's because it's like a compass needle, right? You the way that yeah, exactly. the way that mag yeah. magnetism works is you get alignment. Yeah. The and, compass is permanently magnetized. But you don't have you don't have the poles. There are no, no north and south poles in this uh, in this eclipse, you know? Yeah. So, so this is why you can do the, 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 the opposite. You don't have it's not a real magnet, you know. I yes. uh, and yeah. So a compass needle, yes, is uh, permanently magnetized, but you can make yeah. your own compass needle if you just take a pin and you take a magnet. And you like stroke the magnet along the pin a few times, and then you align the 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 molecules inside the pin. Then you've created a ferromagnet there, and it'll last until you bang it and you know disrupt the alignment. Uh, but uh, what you can do is you can take a pin and you know on a like even on a bit of water or something, you let it go on the surface, and you've basically got yourself a compass. Yeah, yeah. No, ex if I well understood because I was no, there, there was an interruption. However, um, can you hear me now, Claire? Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. No, no. But in fact, okay, it's not it's not a, a, a permanent ma magnetization. So you have the north and south pole. It's just that you magnetize because this is a, a ferromagnetic material, and so you align uh, a, the inner magnets let's say to the to the to the to the magnetic field but this is why you can do that both you cannot uh, is not needed uh, so you 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 don't have you don't have if it would have been a, a real magnet uh, north and south it, there was no way to to do this so does that answer your question it, it, or would it, you like a bit more explanation is as is as is as the powder uh, the, the what? iron powder you do you know the classical experiment you do with the, a magnet and the other iron powder on a on a on a sheet on a sheet but there's more of them that's way straight so you can questions is it okay Are we okay there? Yep. Do we have more Any questions? Other question? Yeah. So I have a bit of a general question. Um, when you have these collisions, everything seems very, very controlled. The velocity is very well determined. The position is very well determined. But you always get these um, different events that pop up. What? Is it a quantum mechanical thing? What's the differentiation that causes different events to occur? Oh, fantastic. I love this. Okay, so <laughs> a proton. What is a proton made of? 
How many quarks? Three. Right. Yes. At lowish energies, yes, mm -hmm. we ha we see a proton being made of the three valence quarks. However, you can think of energy like a microscope. So the more energy you have, the further deep in you can zoom in to see the internal structure of something. And conceptually, you're this is the, you're familiar with this concept, right? Because you have visible light, which is you know then you see me as a human. But if you bombard me with higher wavelength light, like X rays, then you will see my internal structure. So it's the same thing when we're taking protons and we're speeding them up. At the energies of the LHC, a proton, yes, you, it, it has the three valence quarks, but you also see the gluons that are connecting the quarks. You also see quark-anti-quark -quark pairs popping in and out of existence. This is, this is a thing that happens because of quantum mechanics, even in a vacuum. You can get particle-antiparticle pairs just being created out of nothing. And as long as they come back and annihilate themselves quick enough, Mother Nature is like, okay, you know what? I'm going to pretend I didn't see that happen. <laughs> and this is happening all the time inside a proton. When you speed up a proton to the, the speeds, the energies that we have them inside the LHC, we can see these particle-antiparticle pairs. We have measured, so a, a, a proton, the, the three valence quarks are up and down quarks. We have measured charm quarks, in like the amount of charm quarks inside a proton from these virtual pairs that exist for a fraction of a time. So what's happening when you're smashing protons at the LHC? The protons are not just bouncing off each other. The protons are breaking apart and actually, it's one of the quarks or gluons or anti-quarks from each of the protons that fuse together to combine to give us something interesting. So the easiest way to make a Higgs boson, for example, is for a gluon from each of the protons to fuse together, and then you get a Higgs boson. And because you've just used like two of the gluons, you've still got all of the rest of the proton that's now broken apart. And those bits are also going to be flying through your detector as well as, you know, whatever the Higgs boson uh, has decayed into because it only lives for a fraction of a time. So because this is what makes protons, <clears throat> uh, proton colliders, such ideal discovery machines, because there are so many different ways that you can combine a quark or a gluon or an antiquark from this proton with a different flavor of quark, glue, uh, or antiquark or, or, or gluon from the other proton. And you get a whole range of possibilities. Um, and that's why that's why proton colliders are so awesome. Okay. Sonia, where are you right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh. if, uh, if uh, I, I would like to add that, in fact, uh, usually we, let's say the steps uh, in general in, uh, in uh, let's say, in uh, particle physics, uh, when you use colliders, uh, they are an, altern an, uh, an alternation between uh, um, hadron colliders, as uh, LHC is, uh, using the so composite particles and uh, fundamental particles colliders. For example, before the LHC, we had the, the LEP. The LEP was colliding fundamental particles as electrons and positrons, but before this one, um, there was another collider which was, was using was uh, was the SPS basically was a collider that um, now is uh, just an accelerator is the the middle ring uh, at CERN and this one was using uh, uh, protons and antiprotons so the process that Claire was describing that when you smash two protons or one they say two composite particles give us uh, the way to have uh, many particles you can produce while when you have uh, a fundamental particles collider you just focus on one particle in fact in fact the lab before the LHC was focusing on Ws and Z0 and Z0 particles to study much uh, much better the only this kind of particles let's say in the next future we would like uh, maybe to build a um, a collider with fundamental particles in such a way that we can focus to the energy of the Higgs boson 
And so you produce a huge amount of X bosons. So you, you, you increase the statistics, you increase your knowledge on this unique particles. While when you have the, the, the Hadron Colliders, you have many particles. It's called the Discovery Collider, the Discovery Machine. Now I, I am in the control room. So the control room is basically as two rooms. One is this side. So I, I don't want to speak too high. However, we have the, mm -hmm. the I introduce you the shift leader for today. Yeah. Hello, you Mia. <laughs> and then, okay, um, we have the DIQ part. You see many screens, uh, for example, okay, here we can see the physics, but we have also in other places. So we have a proton physics, a stable beam. And uh, basically, let's say very roughly, you see these two graphics, they are describing uh, uh, the one with the one, uh, this is the luminosity, so the, the amount, let's say, of collision, but uh, the other one is the intensity, the current flowing uh, in, uh, which is, uh, represents the two beam uh, in, um, in the, the two beams which are running inside the, the collider, which collides. You can also see other information about the beams, for example, IB1, IB2, and the energy, which is a 6.7 uh, uh, TV and uh, many other okay and then we have uh, some information very technical information as you see below which uh, are not only concerning uh, cms but also the other four experiments so these are coming directly this information from the lhc uh, control room and so each uh, points uh, each experiment uh, can know the status uh, and the conditions of the other four uh, three experiments um, then the rest is quite technical but however we have some uh, here is the diaq part we have some uh, event displays here i don't know if they are running okay they are running. yeah that's a they beautiful are, one yeah yes they, we have um, events so if you do the the the, the master class with the students uh, through the quarknet program usually they analyze this kind of events and they have to recognize which kind of uh, uh, particles are have been produced are produced inside the detector and then they have to trace back uh, the mother particle who uh, which produced the, these, uh, uh, these particles inside the detector, as Claire was describing before, showing uh, uh, the sketch of CMS. And then, okay, on the other side, maybe, okay, there are many other screens. Of very, I don't want to disturb, I should ask every person here, but I don't know, I see, I see them very busy. <laughs> However, on this other side, we have, uh, you remember I was talking about the, the big brother, here it is. <laughs> I was talking that the control room is looking at us. So even inside the elevator, you see, okay, here is all the part of the stuff for the dosimeter. There is another dosimeter that we use when we access the experimental cavern, which is the operational dosimeter. Maybe I can show you this one of this. Is this one, this dosimeter. Um, then we have to calibrate, let's say, to initialize this dosimeter. Now it's only written CMS, but basically this reacts immediately. So if there is a, a leakage of radiation, this start to beep. While mine that I've shown you before, this one, this is integrated. So this means that I need to read in the in the reader, and uh, usually it's only summing up the radiation. This reacts at the moment, so this is important. Usually when we go in the cavern, we use both. But now I didn't need today because uh, this was not was not uh, required. And then you see here, uh, okay, the magnetic field maybe is important. Okay, this is the current flowing inside our man magnet today. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> you see. So this is the current. If you know how much is one amp. You can understand that 18,000 amps is really a huge amount of current intensity. Uh, we can just go fastly on the other side to show you um, the other people which works in the control room. And they are taking care, let's say, babysitting, if you want, 
the sub detector. So the single parts of the detector, you have, you have seen that the CMS is done as a old particle physics detector. They is done in layers. Each layer starting from the center, you have the tracking system, then you have the electromagnetic system, uh, and then you have the hadron, let's say detector, the hadron detector, and then you have the muon chambers. So here you have uh, each post, which is uh, uh, taking care of these uh, detectors. So for example, here is the post of the ECAL. Sometimes you don't have people, so the electromagnetic calorimeter, you don't have shifters just because uh, everything is, uh, let's say, uh, automatized, or uh, you can see also from other control. There is another uh, another control room in Meren, or you can see from your office. So you don't need sometimes uh, to stay here. Only if you have to work, for example, here we have uh, one person who is uh, taking care of his you can do tests sometimes. So it depends uh, which is the program of the detector. But OK, these are all the monitors. Uh, uh, these are the drift tubes, uh, uh, so the muon chambers uh, uh, part. OK, so uh, are there any specific questions of the call? Ah, OK, there is one thing which is very important. First, you see, this is a control room, but OK. Let's joke a little bit more. You see how many bottles? <laughs> we have champagne, we have wine. We have many things because let's say, uh, in general at CERN, we like uh, to toast for any any success, but should be not uh, really important. Okay, we are happy to reach our, our let's say, goals. Uh, so we are very, okay, and usually we, we just uh, use wine or champagne. This bottle is, uh, is special. Why? You see that there is uh, this uh, bag. And this uh, was, uh, how to say, a way. Uh, in these bags, uh, it goes, uh, it, at that time, uh, there was a card for the coffee machine that was used by the people doing the, sh the night shift. And uh, it happens uh, sometimes that uh, the, the shifter in the afternoon was taking his coffee and putting in his pocket the card and going back home. So the, the, the shifters in the nights were without the card for the coffee machine. So they decided, you see, to use this very hardware system to put the, the, the card in the, in the, inside, with the bottle. So there was no way to put the bottle inside the pocket. And so they were sure. No, this is, but okay, you see, this is not a story. This is a reality, okay. In that <laughs> way, the problem, they solved the problem of the card, the, the, the stolen card uh, for the coffee machine. And now they are using, uh, we have, you know, now we have uh, the contactless, so we don't need any more these, uh, let's say, prehistoric, uh, but very effective system uh, to avoid this. <laughs> I'm, I'm then... actually on night shift again tonight, uh, and I can tell you that coffee is very important uh, between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Yes. Okay. I, I I know. Let's say that the night shifts sometimes can be can be quiet, but you need a coffee. Uh, I can talk more about the night shifts in the AMS control room, and there I can tell you that they are not so quiet because uh, uh, as the sh the shift leader, if you do the shift leader shift, you stay in the voice loop, the NASA voice voice loop, basically as in US, of course. <laughs> it's not the night. You listen. You are. You have to. You must listen all the communication. So you you need really to not to sleep, and uh, so you need much more than a coffee. Unfortunately, unfortunately, inside the AMS control room, coffee is not allowed. Drink is not is not allowed. Food is not allowed. So there I'll you stay have with to CMS. find your. <laughs> exactly when you have a croissant in the morning. AMS is not like that, but okay. However, this is another study. Each, this is just to say that also, let's say the, the control rooms, they, they run, they have their own rules, depending on the collaboration and uh, uh, you can have more relaxed rules uh, or more strict rules, it depends. Let's say that in AMS, most of the rules comes from NASA. And so, okay, we have to follow these rules. <laughs> okay, I think I come back to the other side unless there are questions. Great, yeah, we'll see you soon. Uh, do we have any other questions from uh, question. from them? Questions? 
But that 18,000 volts amps. That's running through the superconductor. Yes, exactly. What, uh, what, uh, is there any voltage required to keep it going? Uh, yes. A little bit? There's a little, there are losses in the superconductor? Um, so it's just a couple of volts. The, the main thing is to get the current flowing uh, and you want the current flowing with no resistance because if you have even a little bit of resistance, then the entire thing is going to heat up and melt, uh, which would be very bad. So uh, it's it's mostly low voltage, super high, super high current um, and super cooled with liquid helium to minus 269 degrees. We had a story yesterday on our tour here of the quenching when they get explosions, like they would hear these loud explosions in the in the tunnel. I think that happened there too, didn't it? it yeah, it, it can happen in a bunch of different ways. So, um, you know, a lot of if everything that needs to yeah. run at high current has, is is uh, superconducting, right? So it's it's cooled with these cryogenic gases. And there are um, what we call burst disks which are like little, dis if, if there's a bit of overpressure, they're designed to burst and, and release the overpressure. But I think what you're thinking about is in 2008, September, um, we just started the LHC running and the dipole magnets. So there are, I don't know if you've seen those big blue dipole magnets, there are 1,232 of these big 16 meter long dipole magnets all the way around the LHC ring. Um, and these are like their job is just to keep the protons going around in a circle. And these are the ones that are cooled down to 1.8 Kelvin and run at eight Tesla magnetic field. So what actually happened back then was um, once between, between each magnet, you have to connect it up electronically and when welded. And one of the in interconnects was slightly off and started developing a bit of resistance that resistance caused a spark that spark punctured through a line feeding liquid helium in and then a lot of liquid helium was let out into you know the tunnel in a very very short amount of time and it expanded and cooled and it was essentially an explosion from you know gas expanding and cooling down. Apparently, the tunnel looked a bit like a Yeti's cave um, immediately afterwards. And it it just like these dipole magnets, which are huge and mounted to the floor on concrete blocks, they were pushed, um, you know, meters down. It was very forceful. Um, so yeah, you don't want to mess with cryogenics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I was uh, thinking. Okay, I I don't know if I listened to there was an interruption then maybe uh it's not a qu the quenching uh, that we had uh, okay in uh, uh in uh, lhc uh, but uh, there is a movie from uh, one experience uh, which now is not working anymore which is called the cloud maybe you can find on the web where they were inducing the quenching so you can see so it's a controlled quenching and you can see however oh it's a, a sort of tea tea cup i don't know tea machine a coffee machine okay you see this as a steam is not a steam of course that is going out so it's quite interesting there are a few seconds of this movie which is quite interesting but uh okay, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. you gave uh yes here i met one uh fireman he was uh one of the first people <gasps> entering wow. uh, the lhc uh cavern he told me yes exactly as you said okay you said the yeti i would say i don't know frozen <laughs> frozen. Yeah. frozen the movie hadn't come out at that yes, point this, exactly. this was pre-frozen almost let like that frozen yeah was not okay any other question i don't know i'm alive however <laughs> yes thank you so much for the underground tour it was amazing and it was so cool Absolutely. to see all of the, the do do we have any more questions yeah. about anything you know physics not physics. Uh, you you mentioned you're an astroparticle physicist. How long before we get a particle detector on Mars? <laughs> ah, well, we have to get to Mars. Yes, Earth. exactly. Okay, I would think Reliably. before how we can protect. We okay, 
but detectors we can bring to Mars, but people, we, we have the big issue for uh, the, you know, the radiation because uh, now the, the International Space Station is uh, in the inner part is protected by the magnetic field of the Earth. So there is no big issue, even if they are taking some radiation. In fact, okay, they have uh, some issue with the osteoporosis and other things, uh, uh, not only for the gravity, but also uh, there is a, there is a, maybe if you are interested in this, uh, there is the comparison between uh, Scott Kelly and um, um, how, how is the other one? Uh, Mark Kelly, the two, one is uh, the two, they were in the, also in the Congress, I guess, so now they are politicians and uh, they were two, they are two twins, uh, homozygous twins, uh, and there were two commanders of the space shuttle and also uh, going to the space station. And so they were used, let's say, as a cross check for one twin on the Earth and the other one on the space station for almost one year. And so you can see the damage that Scott had because Scott was the one who spent almost one year on the on the space station. So this is the big issue. But Scott is younger now. Because yes, he was going faster. Yes, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. He gained a few milliseconds. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think he has, uh, you know, is uh, the reactivity of the brain, for example, also the, uh, the, the, the site, which was a little bit uh, lowered, and many other things. Uh, uh that I, I i only know that when they uh, they came uh, mark came they said that they didn't want to have anything more to do with doctors because they were cross-checked so many times sure. However, this is the big issue now uh not mars i would say okay space explore exploration the moon let's start with the moon Let's start with the moon. Yeah, there's plans to go yes, back there, right? It is on yeah. the moon. I think we should build, after we build the FCC, which will be a 100 kilometer long tunnel, we're hoping. Um, so the LHC will feed into an, a bigger 100 kilometer long tunnel that will go under the lake and under the mountains over here. Then I think the next thing we should try and build one on the moon. Imagine you can do, build a, a big yeah right around the circumference of the moon uh, okay maybe we can do both because you know the two things that are going in parallel and uh, as uh, okay if we go, we go we should say if you go through nasa which has uh, how to say is connected with uh, also the army etc would i be allowed to drink coffee in my control room on the moon <laughs> that's the most important question. uh okay uh, let me say okay Yes, exactly. <laughs> Maybe you can drink bubbles or something like that almost. No, but let's say, okay, this is a peculiar thing. I don't know if our guests, they know uh, something about the Professor Samuel Ting. This is a rule coming from Professor Samuel Ting. I invite you to, to dig a little bit on this Nobel Prize. This is a scientist is a Nobel Prize for the JPSI discovery in 1976. Um, J Sai, J Sai, J Sai, no, J -Sai. Yes, no, but uh, you know, recently I, uh, I, I learned that even on the other collaboration, they were not allowed to talk it uh, J Psi, but only Psi. So what's so, happening here, by the way, are particle physicists fighting over the naming of a particle, and this yeah. this particle, two people sort of co-discovered it, and they each gave it a different name, and nobody could decide which name it was. So now it's got two names. The J is the, the only the particle in physics. I think so. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's a cool particle. Yeah. But you know, this is uh, an example of a scientific collaboration <laughs> as uh, between yes. the CMS and Atlas. That's and one way to put it. So let's say we are all friends uh, publicly. And then. <laughs> And then, and then, okay. <laughs> but yeah, the so Sam Ting, uh, Prof. Sam Samuel Ting, he's uh from MIT, right? Yes, yes. he's a full professor at MIT, and uh, he he's the one who conceptualized the AMS uh, experiment, which is this particle physics detector uh, detecting. It, it, one of the main goals is to try to see a, a signature of dark matter coming from space, um, and it sits, it lives on the International Space Station, and there's actually. Actually, a Disney Plus. Um, uh, there was there was a, a limited a little series on Disney Plus all about the you know the the AMS two and fixing this uh, in 2016. I don't know if it's still available, but you know I'm sure it's it's somewhere. No, it no, no, exactly. Okay, yeah, but let's say that. Okay, 
as a, I don't know, I have some disturbing here. So basically the story about this experiment is that, uh, okay, um, there was a pilot experiment in 1998, okay, where we proved that, okay, I was not there at that time, uh, that we proved that, that the electronics, for example, in space was working because, you know, we have uh, an issue for the radiation, uh, etc., the hardware radiation. But then uh, we started to build this data detector and, okay, the, the, they say the most important thing uh, at that time was uh, to have uh, the most powerful uh, um, superconducting magnet in space, uh, which then uh, we have to replace, not because it was not working, it was working very well. The problem was that the tank for the liquid helium was planned to last for three years and half. And then the, 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 the helium consumption, when we received the magnet from the, the company, which was a company in UK, it was a private company in UK, uh, the, the helium consumption was much more. When we did the one year of test here at CERN, because I have to specify, the experiment is not a CERN experiment, but was hosted and is recognized as an important experiment. Is a, In fact, in the database, you see RE1 is not AMS. Is a recognized experiment one. Um, RE stands for recognized experiment. Yes, yes exactly. Physicists are terrible with acronyms. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this was to say that the CERN is not putting uh, one uh, uh, euro or dollar on this, but uh, there was it was hosting the detector, the the assembly of the detector, and also giving uh, supporting, for example, with technicians, uh, the, the assembly of the detector. So basically, we did one year of test. And uh, then we, we, we had the window. This magnet uh, in the lucky case uh, could have last uh, for two years. So the power for the power, uh, the, sorry, the, the helium consumption, but in the worst case, uh, six months. And so we asked ourselves, uh, we are building a detector. We send this detector in space. Uh, all the other components of the detector, they can last uh, mainly forever. And then we have the magnet, which is one, the main part, because not only the dark matter, but also the antimatter, the cosmic antimatter. If you lose the, 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 the magnetic field, you cannot distinguish between the matter and antimatter. So uh, we decided to use the magnet, which was a part of the, of the, of the pilot experiment in 1998. I don't know where is this magnet. But okay, Wait, I just can, lost the magnet. No, I can do a guess. The 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 magnet, uh, the permanent magnet, which now is uh, on the experiment, and before was uh, in 1998, was just uh, let's say uh, a test, was uh, uh, stored in China. I don't see any against to think so that the, to think that even this one is in China. But I know, I don't know, I don't know, frankly. I know that it's working because, okay, we did, and it was just uh, to have uh, a more lasting uh, detector. In fact, it's 12 years that uh, the detector is now in, uh, in space uh, without uh, the, the permanent <coughs> magnet that we have now. Uh, maybe what is interesting, uh, apart of this, the story of the magnet is the, to to, if you if you are interested, because it's a special magnet, it's called yeah. the magic ring magnet, because basically when you are in space, you cannot couple the magnetic field of the magnet with the magnet the Earth magnetic field. So everything the lines should be closed, not as uh, what I was showing before. Yeah. And uh, there is a paper uh, about uh, this concept. Uh, maybe if you are interested, you can find this paper and read about this. This is quite interesting about uh, the magic ring uh, magnet. But, you know, just the logistics of building these things. AMS is relatively small. I think yeah, it's, no, it's, it's like, it's it's like this, right, compared to compared to Three our Three meters, big... diameters, uh, five meters is a cylinder again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we love cylinders. May I use one of my yes, favorite food? food. <laughs> yes, it's a Big Mac. Because, uh, because uh, you know, okay, when you have when you have a collider, you need the, you need the structure which is a, a an horizontal cylinder, and then you have all the layers uh, all around the the collision point, while uh, AMS uh, receives particles from the top to the bottom. So it's a sort of uh, Big Mac, right. you know, yeah. many many layers, five meters tall, and uh, three meters uh, as diameter. 
more I, I just love you know the stories of the installation and because you know building one of these experiments whether it's something here like this something this big 100 meters underground or something smaller but you know a couple of kilometers up in space it's just uh, really really interesting yes um, maybe if you want mainly the difference uh, the level a technical level is uh i can give you an ex a, a comparison uh, for example we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, silicon detectors as also CMS, not pixels, but uh, you see the the bright, not the central part, the other part which is golden part, uh, which uh, which is a microstrip uh, technology. We have also we have the double sided microstrip. Now here is the single sided, but basically when you build a detector like this one, uh, you need of course to, for example, uh, to uh, to glue elements, uh, to, to not only to 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 do the, the 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 detector itself, the sensor itself, and for example, one uh, easy things uh, that you have to do that you don't think you don't do for a, a, an experiment on the ground is that you have to outgas the glue, because if you glue all the screws, they are uh, they are glued. Because you cannot leave glue, uh, because of the of the rocket, uh, the vibration of the rocket, uh, these screws they can unscrew. They can, and so they are flying in the vacuum. You can imagine with electronics what you, you can do. But then, if there's gas trapped inside there, uh, yes. Uh, the, before using your glue, you have to have gas the 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 bubbles of air. So otherwise, you cannot use the glue. Here is not needed. Or, for example, I I told you before that I was involved in the cabling. And were optical fibers, and so when I had to do the connection to the panel of, which was a mapping, okay, to fire the the then the laser beams inside the detector to make uh, a sort of uh, let's say was an alignment of the detector is a, a system of alignment of the detector, and then uh, I I had just to write uh, forty numbers uh, from one to forty on the connectors and on the panel, just to say, okay, the one goes for uh, with the 10, for example, and the three goes with the 39, et cetera, was a mapping. And I had to wait two months from NASA to receive the answer from NASA, which was uh, the, the right uh, um, space qualified marker to use uh, to write these four oh, numbers, wow. okay? Wow. So this you don't do with this, but of course, uh, uh, you 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 have other issues besides, yeah. for example. So I actually have a fun story about uh, part of the CMS detector, um, which actually relates to QuarkNet. So one of the calorimeters in CMS uh, is the hadronic calorimeter. And the calorimeters are designed to stop particles as they as they move through. And in stopping them, you get this shower of light. And by measuring the amount of light that you get, you can tell the energy that the particle had um, as it was coming through. So the hadronic calorimeter is, is a calorimeter that's designed to stop any particle that's made up of quarks, like protons, neutrons, and that sort of thing. And when they built it, what they need, what you have, you have the 17 layers of uh, brass and then scintillator material. So the brass slows the particles down and, ma and, and, and makes a shower of light. And then the scintillator catches the light that you can read it out. There's 17 layers of this, but you need it, when they were building this, they needed really, really high quality brass, which they couldn't find anywhere in the world until some Russian colleagues noted that this is military grade brass and they went to the military storms in Russia and gathered together over a million World War II brass shell casings, melted them down and turned them into the 17 layers of our calorimeter. Um, so I think that's a really cool, you know, fun fact about, you know, yeah, taking... Only that, okay, proves also that if we want, we can use a brass... Uh in a more clever way exactly <laughs> but I also <laughs> a nice a nice thing if another nice fact about the h the hadronic calorimeter is that uh 400 electronic components for the hadronic calorimeter were actually built by quarknet students um so we have you know literally got quarknet that made stuff 100 meters underneath our feet right now which i think helping us 
you know, read out information about Higgs bosons and things. So I think that's very cool. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay. Those are the uh, optical detector units. Yes. Yeah, we named we named our dog Odie after the after them. That is amazing. <laughs> I love that story. Now I'm going to tell that story every time I tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> Odie, that's so cool. Um, all right, are there any more? We've 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 been speaking a lot. Would yes. you would you guys like to ask us more exactly. questions? We'll we'll stay here and talk for for forever until dinner time. No, we don't mind. Uh, but if you want to ask us questions, please. I'm getting I'm getting evil looks from the people there. They're going to throw something at me. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, the real thing is that here is uh, too hot. Yeah, I wouldn't it's mind really if you throw a water hot. balloon. That would be good. I like to be to be underground before. <laughs> yeah, go back in the control room. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. No question. We melted we'll say, all your brains. We'll say thank you very much. <laughs> It's absolutely a pleasure. It was very, very nice talking to you all um, and, you know, getting to take you on a little bit of a tour of this really, really cool place that we happen to work. We hope to, we hope to see you. Do, do, are you planning to come here to visit CMS? <laughs> Everyone wants to come. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. if you, you do, get in, if, absolutely get in touch. Uh, we'd love to meet you in person. Um, otherwise, you know, maybe we'll see you in a master class at some point. Yes. Okay. Why not? I think we met in one master class, of course, because you know we met virtually. And however, in case uh, any of you couldn't come in the in the let's say in the near future, consider that when we are in from January to March, our of course, as there is no BIM, our virtual visits uh, they allows the guide to go the underground guide to go inside the cavern but not only inside the cavern on the balcony but even on the basement even on the roof so you can see much more that you could see even if you were here in person so profit of also this uh, of this uh, chance because it's really it's really nice yeah, we'd be happy to do a link up with yeah. your class, for example, if you would like uh, to do a tour for them. So, Okay. Well, I think uh, that is that. We thank you thank all you very much. Yeah. Uh, for questions, uh, for uh, yeah. listening to yeah. us, uh, attending this meeting. Uh, we hope that, okay, we, we were answering your questions, uh, those you asked and those you didn't ask. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. Uh, I hope that uh, we haven't melted your brains too much. Uh, my brain certainly feels like it's kind of melting over here. We're having a heat wave. But uh, it was excellent chatting to you and hope to see you around at CMS at some point in the future. Nice. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.